أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكال الظالمين سريخ المستسرخين موضع حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين ثم الصلاة والسلام على الشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد سلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته We have been requested this evening to remember all those who are sick especially those who are in the hospitals or those who are undergoing procedures and operations for the Almighty to grant them a complete and a quick recovery with the barakah of the ayah of Shafa five times recited for them بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء 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 صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Last night we spoke about the philosophy and the etiquettes of the sujood. And tonight we would like to end our discussion by speaking about the etiquettes, the dhikr, and the philosophy of the tashahhud and the salam. Now I'd like to begin by talking about one of the important etiquettes of tashahhud. The scholars say that a person sitting in the state of tashahhud should have a posture of humility and humbleness. His head should be gazing down at the space between his knees and that his thighs should be in parallel and he should put his hands on his thighs. That is the nature of the humbleness that he should have. And you will notice that this was there even before the coming of Islam. Not only in Arabian culture but generally in Asian cultures. Even those cultures which were outside of Arabia. When a person wanted to make an important request in front of someone who was greater than him and he wanted to implore and humble himself, sometimes you will find that that person would have sat down on the ground instead of standing or sitting uh, on a chair, sat down on the ground and then started to implore the person who is in front of him. <clears throat> Ayatollah Jawad Maliki Tabrizi who is one of the great scholars who has written about ethics and spirituality, he says, notice that generally you recite the tashahhud towards the end of your salat, and of course also in the uh, second rak'ah of the salat. But he says at the end of the salat, there should be an important realization that comes within us. We recognize that no matter how hard we have tried, our salat is going to have its defects. We will not be sometimes able to concentrate the way we want to concentrate. Our sincerity may not be the best as it is supposed to be. And our efforts may also be lacking. 
At that time, he says, it's important to have this humbleness in the heart where we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we say to you, Allah, oh Allah, we ask you to accept our prayer and to give us the reward for it despite the defects in our prayer. Even in the salat, our state should be between khawf and raja. The fear that God may not accept our deeds because of the defects and the hope that He will accept our deeds despite the defects. Okay? <clears throat> and you find this is a fundamental difference that we have within Islam and other faiths, like Christianity, for example. Whenever we have interfaith dialogue, one of the questions that often comes up from our fellow Christians, one of the questions that they may ask you is how do you know that you have attained salvation? Does there ever come a point in your faith where you can be certain that you have finally attained salvation? Because in Christian theology, the moment a person believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that is all that he needs to be able to attain salvation. His deeds, his character, his etiquettes, are not instrumental in attaining salvation. So they will ask you, at what point in Islam can you be confident in your life that now you are going to be Jannati? You will certainly be entering paradise. And we say in Islam, at never, at any point in your life can you be certain until you reach the moment of death. You always have to have two states in your heart. One, the state of khawf, the fear of God's punishment, that I may stray away from the right path or God may not accept the deeds that I have performed. And at the same time in our heart, we must have hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This doesn't mean that as a Muslim, I am not sure about the path of Islam. No, I am certain that the path of Islam, the one brought by the Prophet of Allah, is the one and only correct path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the question I always ask myself, am I on the right path? Will I always remain on the right path? That is something that we always have to be concerned about. You find that the Ahlul Bayt السلام, themselves also practiced this as well. There's a beautiful narration about the fourth holy Imam, Al Imam al Sajjad, alayhi afdalus salati was salam. In this narration, the Imam says, or it is narrated by one of the companions, that he saw the Imam at a time which was closer to the time of Sahar, the time of mourning. And he was around the Kaaba at a time when no one else was around the Kaaba. And when the Imam realized now there is nobody around the Kaaba, the Imam started a beautiful munajat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. And in his munajat, the Imam fell into prostration and tears were flowing from his eyes. So this companion, he came to the Imam and he took the head of the Imam and put it in his own forehead. When the fourth Imam realized that his head had been removed from sujood, he sat up and he said, who has distracted me from talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The man said, Ya Ibn Rasulillah, I am so and so. When I heard you reciting this munajat, the way you were seeking forgiveness from God, I myself broke down into tears. And I said to myself, we are the sinners. We are the criminals. You are the grandson of the Prophet of Allah. You are the grandson of Amirul Mu'mineen. Your grandmother is Lady Fatima. We are the ones who need to recite this forgiveness. Not you, Ya Ibn Rasulillah. Now listen to the answer of the Imam. This hadith has been mentioned in our original books of hadith. Okay. Now whether it is sahih or not, that is something you can look into. But it is mentioned over there. He said, Da'anni hadith abi wa ummi wa jaddi. To that effect. Stop these stories of who is my father. 
and who is my mother and who is my grandfather right this is not the criteria that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has on the day of judgment for anybody خَلَقَ اللَّهُ الْجَنَّةَ لِمَنْ أَطَاعَهُ وَلَوْ كَانَ عَبْدًا حَبَشِيًّا God has created paradise for the one who obeys him, whoever he is, even if he is a Ethiopian slave, an Abyssinian slave. وَخَلَقَ اللَّهُ النَّارَ لِمَنْ عَصَاهُ وَلَوْ كَانَ If I'm not mistaken, to the effect of غُلَامًا قُرَشِيًّا and God has created the fire of hell for whoever disobeys him, even if it is a Qurayshi lad. Right? The criteria in the eyes of God is obedience and disobedience. Right? Then how can we as the followers of the Ahlul Bayt ever be so certain about our own actions, our own sincerity, our own faith to say that we shall certainly enter paradise? Khawf and Raja are very important for us to have in our lives. The khawf, the fear that we have, it prevents us from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the hope that, it, that we have, it prevents us from losing despair in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person before he commits a sin should be full of fear. That if I commit this sin, God may not forgive me and put me in the fire of hell. Right? But once he has committed a sin, now he should turn to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never lose hope and be despaired from the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, as we end our salat, we also stand on the pedestal of hope and fear. Hope that God will accept our prayers despite the defects and the fear that God may not accept our prayers because of the defects. Now the Ahlul Bayt and the Prophet of Allah have taught us some beautiful recitations in the tashahud. And we begin by saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika la, wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. <coughs> I testify to the oneness of God and the prophethood of the Prophet of Allah. The sixth Imam says when you are reciting the tashahud, make certain that your tongue is in harmony with your heart. That you actually believe in what you are saying. That when you say there is no God but Allah and I testify to that, that means that now that I am ending my prayer or close to ending my prayer and I'm going to enter the life of this world, I make a pact to myself that my life, it will be given purpose by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My hope and my fear is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My confidence and my courage only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing can happen in my life, only that which is wished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first Imam says, a person can never taste the taste and the sweetness of Iman until he believes that whatever happens in his life is in the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I end the Salat, let me once again make a commitment to the Prophet of Allah and accept the Risala and the authority of the Prophet of Allah. I remind myself that now that I'm going to walk out of the Masjid, step out of my Musalla, my way of life will be like the Prophet of Allah. In the Sunnah of the Prophet of Allah. Very important. One of the persons who lived this philosophy was Bilal. Bilal who had been freed in the time of the Prophet of Allah and became the Mu'addin of the Prophet of Allah. That the Prophet said that the scene of Bilal is more beloved than the sheen of anybody else. Okay? And it's very interesting, the Prophet of Allah, on the day of the conquest of Mecca, he knew the racism that was prevalent in Arabian society. As if to make a very symbolic gesture, he told Bilal, the day they entered Mecca, they entered at the time of Dhuhr, he told Bilal, Oh Bilal, climb on top of the Kaaba, and from the roof of the Kaaba, give the adhan for everybody to hear. So when Bilal was found out to be a Muslim, he used to go in the middle of the night and listen to the teachings of the Holy Prophet. When his master found out that Bilal is a Muslim, 
he started to threaten him, to torture him, to persecute him. And Umayyah said to him, just once say the name of Hubal, or once say the name of the idols, and I shall free you. And Bilal gave such a beautiful response. He said to him, Oh Umayyah, do you think I have accepted Islam because I have been deceived? Because there was a temptation or a desire within me? Only because I wanted to rebel against you? No, by God. This Islam has given me a sense of purpose in life. No matter what you do to me, no matter what oppression and torture you met out against, you meet out against me, I shall never leave the path of Islam. Ahad, Ahad. And that's how a Muslim should be when he is sitting in the tashahud. He should remind himself of his conviction towards his faith. Now I have a question for you. It's a mental exercise for us to do. <clears throat> Sometimes a person for 70 years of his life, he says in the salat, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. He says it in the adhan. He says it so often in his life, la ilaha illallah, for 70 years. And then he dies. And then he goes into his grave. And the first night, Munkar and Nakir come to him. And you would think they would ask him some of the most difficult questions that he has faced in his life. Because he has gone through madrasa, he has heard so many lectures, he has read so many books. They would ask him some of the most difficult questions. But what do they ask him? They ask him a question that today, if you were to ask a five-year-old child in the madrasa, even he would be able to answer you. Correct? They come and ask you, who is your Lord? Who is your prophet? What is your book? What is your religion? So why do they do that? Because it seems that there is a difference between those things that we have understood and those things that we have accepted in our heart and they have become a part of our existence. Only those things that have become a part of our flesh and blood, that have penetrated into the depth of our heart, by which we live our lives, are the things that I will be able to respond with when I am in my grave. Imagine a person who on his tongue he says, I believe there is no God but Allah. But in his heart he believes that his rizq does not come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In his heart he believes that his rizq comes from his employer directly, right? His risk is in the hands of his employer. Believe me, when that person goes in the grave and the angel asks him, Man Rabbuk, who is your Lord? Instead of saying Allah Jalla Jalala, even though for 70 years, that's what he said in his salat, he will respond at that time with that which is in his heart. And he might just say, it is my employer. And therefore, the sixth Imam says that when you are reciting the tashahud, try to make sure that your claims are in harmony with what is in your heart. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And then the tashahud ends with the salawat, which is obligatory in the tashahud. In the hadith of the sixth Imam, he says the relationship of the salawat to the prayer is like the relationship of zakatul fitra to the psalm and the fasting. A person's fast in the month of Ramadan cannot be complete and perfect until he pays or the zakatul fitra, if he has the responsibility of paying that is, he pays the zakatul fitra on the day of Eid. Similarly, a person's salat cannot be complete and perfect until he sends salawat on the Prophet and the family of the Prophet of Allah. Now why is it so important that we send this salawat especially towards the end of our prayer? Okay. You find that whenever we send salawat on the Prophet of Allah, the Prophet of Allah also makes dua for us. This is a principle that we have in our faith. When you do something that pleases the heart of the Prophet of Allah and you obey the teachings of the Holy Prophet, you find he will also make dua for you as well. Let me start with a simple example. 
It is narrated that when the verse was revealed, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَتْ تُطَحِّرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ O Prophet of Allah, take from their wealth sadaqa. Here sadaqa means take their zakat, take their khums, take their religious dues. Why? Because when you do that, you purify them and you cleanse them. And O Prophet of Allah, when you take their wealth from them, also make dua for them as well. And therefore it was the practice of the Prophet. Somebody would come and give his zakat, the Prophet would make dua for him. When this verse was revealed, the first person to come to the Prophet of Allah and give his zakat was a man by the name of Abu Awfa. So when he gave his zakat to the Prophet of Allah and he obeyed the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet made dua for him. Do you know what is the dua that the Prophet made for him? The Prophet said, Allahumma salli ala Abi Awfa wa ali Abi Awfa. Just as we send salawat on the Prophet, that is exactly what the Prophet of Allah did for this person. <coughs> oh Allah, send your blessings and your mercy upon this person and upon his children as well. Okay? Alama Taba Tabai as well, he explains. He says that there is a verse in the Quran which says that whenever it rains on the mountains, it flows down the mountains and every valley takes in accordance to its own capacity. Okay. This is a beautiful verse of the Quran. It teaches us that God does not hold back His mercy. His mercy is not limited. It only depends how much is our capacity. If our capacity is limited, we should not blame the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah Taba Tabai says, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends His mercy on the Prophet and the family of the Prophet, they also allow it to flow down to the believers as well. And therefore, when you are sending salawat upon the Prophet, the person who is actually benefiting from it is yourself. Spiritually, you are benefiting from it. At the end of our prayer, we send the salawat upon the Prophet and his family so that inshallah with their dua and with their attention, God would accept our prayers as well. God would perfect our prayer as well. And then the salat ends with the salam of the prayer. When a person recites takbiratul ihram, a number of things become haram upon him. They only become halal once he recites the salam of the prayer. And it is sufficient for a person to say in the salam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And it's good to know that, by the way. Because sometimes you may have many qada prayers and you want to shorten your prayer so that you can pray all of them. Then one of the ways to shorten it in the salam is to just recite this one salam and it will end your prayer. But it's recommended that before that you recite two other salams. Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alayna wa ala now there's a beautiful philosophy that Imam Khomeini rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi explains when he talks about why is this the sequence of the salam that we recite? Why is it first the Prophet of Allah? And then second, why is it the believers? And then third, why is it our selves or the angels who are there? So the first salam is to the Prophet of Allah and we'll come to that philosophy. The second salam, Assalamu alayna, may the peace of God be upon us, wa ala ibadillahi salihin, and the righteous servants of God as well. Let's break this expression into two parts. The first part, Assalamu alayna, may the peace of God be upon us. Who is us? Clearly, it refers to ourselves and those who are saying salat with us. Question, what if I'm saying salat by myself? Then do I still say assalamu alayna? And the answer is yes, you still say assalamu alayna. Why? It seems to me that the default form of the prayer is not supposed to be furada. The default form of the prayer is supposed to be jama'ah. The furada is the exception to the default, not the other way around. Okay. Wherever we are, whether it's in the masjid or we are outside, and there's somebody who meets the criteria of an imam, we should try 
our level best to establish salat in jama'ah. This is something that you learn from the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. A poor man once, an old man, a blind old man came to the Prophet of Allah and said, Ya Rasulullah, it is difficult for me to come to the masjid for jama'ah. Should I still come for jama'ah? The Prophet of Allah said, yes, still come for jama'ah. He said, how do I come to the masjid? The Prophet said, get someone from your house to bring you to the masjid. It is narrated that he said to the Holy Prophet, but sometimes there is nobody in my house and I am all alone. How do I come to the masjid? And the Prophet said, draw a rope from your home to the masjid and use that to guide your way to come to the masjid, but come to the masjid for jama'ah. In another narration, we're told that our first holy imam, after the passing away of the Prophet of Allah, and after his right was taken away from him, he made a covenant with himself that he was going to stay home and he was going to now work on compiling a written copy of the Qur'an all into one compilation, into one scripture, and he was also going to write down the tafsir to some extent and explain the asbab of nuzul and other important things about verses of the Qur'an. So he got a letter from the authorities of that time who had taken the authority. And they said to him that you have to present yourself in the court and give bay'ah to the leader of the time or the person who had assumed leadership. Our great scholars have narrated this, by the way. He wrote back and he said, I have made a promise. I have made an ahad to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I am not going to leave my house until I have completed writing down the collection of the Qur'an. And the only time I'm going to put on my abba, in Arabian society you'd put on your abba when you go outside the house, the only time I'm going to put on my abba is when I want to go to the masjid for salat, for jama'ah. Okay. Don't you think that the imam, if he could have avoided saying salat with the muslimin that he would have avoided that as well that is the importance of the jama'ah assalamu alayna wa ala ibadillah salihin and also upon the righteous servants of god now who are these righteous servants of god these righteous servants fall into three categories category number one it refers to the prophets of god and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَزَكَرِيَّا وَيَحْيَا وَعِيسَى وَإِلْيَاسِ كُلَّمْ or كُلُّمْ مِنَ صَالِحِينَ All of these prophets and others, all of them are amongst the righteous. Number one. Second category, it also refers to the righteous believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَنُدْخِلَنَّهُمْ فِي Salihin. As for those who believe and they perform righteous deeds, certainly we will count them amongst the righteous people as well. Third category, When the jinn heard the Prophet of Allah reciting the Quran, they went back to their community and they said, Inna sami'na Quranan ajaba. Indeed, we have heard a very amazing recitation of the Qur'an. And they shared the message of the Prophet with their community as well. In that conversation, the Qur'an says, one of the things that they said, وَأَنَّا مِنَّ الصَّالِحُونَ Amongst us, the jinn, they are some who are good. وَمِنَّا دُونَ ذَلِكَ And they are those, those who are not righteous either. Sometimes the mu'mineen ask, that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create the jinn? In particular, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create shaitan? If God had not created shaitan, my life would be much simpler. I wouldn't have the moral dilemmas that I have. Shaitan would not be whispering into my ear, why did God create him? You find that sometimes our conception of shaitan is very much a Hollywood conception of shaitan taken from Christian theology. 
that shaitan is this person who rules over the fire of hell and he's the gatekeeper of hell and he's got this stick and two horns and that's who shaitan is shaitan is nothing but a jinn and the jinn were created for the same reason that human beings were created وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Why did God create shaitan? For the same reason he created me and you to worship him and to become his slaves God did not create him as shaitan He chose himself to become a shaitan That distinction should be important in our mind Assalamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and may the salams be upon you and the mercy of Allah and his blessings as well. Now what is interesting in the last segment, it doesn't specify who these people are supposed to be. Some of the scholars have said that it refers to those angels who are with us or the angels who are around us, we are saying salam to them. But a number of scholars have said that when you say that last salam, you are saying salam to the mu'mineen who are around you. Especially if you are in the jama'ah, you are saying salam to them. Okay. Before we continue this, the mu'mineen sometimes ask that we notice some of our brothers from the muslimin, when they complete their salat, they look to the right and they also turn their face to the left. Is this also mustahab for us to do or not to do? So Sayyid Sistani has a fatwa on this issue. Somebody asked him, هَلْ يُسْتَحَبُّ إِمَاءُ الْمُصَلِّ بِرَأْسِهِ إِلَىٰ يَمِينِهِ وَيَسَارِحِ بَعْدَ انْتِهَاءِ التَّسْلِيمِ Is it mustahab? You can find it on his website. Is it mustahab for the one who is reciting the salat to turn his head to the right and then to the left after he has completed the salat? الجواب المستحب هو الإشارة بطرف عينه حال التسليم What is mustahab is when a person is reciting the salam with his eyes to look to the right and to look to the left and not to turn his face to the right or to turn his face to the left. This is there in the masail. Now, we see that in the end it doesn't specify who they are. And some of the scholars have said that it refers to the believers. Imam Khomeini rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, he mentions a hadith of the sixth imam. Where the sixth imam says, when a person says Allahu Akbar and he says takbiratul ihram, at that moment his attention turns away from the creatures of God. And his attention turns entirely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From that moment on, until the end of the prayer, he is not allowed to talk to those who are around him. Unless, of course, we understand if it's an emergency, then you can talk to those people who are around you. Otherwise, a person is not allowed to do that. Therefore, the salat ends with the salam. Why? Because when a person is finally ending his prayer, and he is finally allowed to talk to the people who are around him, then the first thing that a Muslim must say to those people who are around him is what? Salamun alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Having said that, the late Imam Khomeini says that when you first enter a gathering, you will say salam to those who are most beloved and dear to you, and those who come after them, and those who come after them. As you come back into this world, the first salam you give is to the one who is most dear to you and that is the Prophet of Allah and then you send the salam to the righteous believers and then you give your salam to those who are around you Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Before we end there is an announcement that inshallah tomorrow night the community has organized a discussion forum for the youth of the community age 16 to 30 for them to come and share their thoughts to share their concerns to share some of their challenges with the leadership of the community with the intention that inshallah there can be a program in a way to uh, help them in the community the youths are encouraged the boys are encouraged to sign up for the session on Sunday night 
and there will be a separate session for the sisters on Tuesday night. We end our session this evening by praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he give us the tawfiq to understand the simple messages of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt and to apply them in our lives. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he accept all of our good deeds and he forgive all of our sins. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he answer all of our hajat. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grant a complete and a quick recovery to all those who are sick and suffering. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he also alleviate the suffering of all those who are suffering around the world, especially our brothers and sisters who are in the Middle East, our brothers and sisters around the world, and especially those who are in Nigeria, in particular Sheikh Ibrahim Saksaki, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect them, to grant them safety and security, and to bring peace and justice back to their lands. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of the 12th Imam. Let us end the session this evening by making dua for the Imam just as he also makes dua for us. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma kulli waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai. Fi hadhihi al-sa'a. وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة